Yeah, I'm going to message Tate too. Okay. I will, um, since we have a quorum, I'll get started with the magic words, which are pursuant to Governor Baker's March 20, uh, 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting laws. This meeting of the TAC is being conducted by a remote participation. Um, and so uh, we are starting a little late um, tonight because of some technical issues, I guess. So I know. Um, Two, three years into Zoom and it's still not always fun. <laughs> so. um, do we want to um, get to the, the minutes or do we want to get right to? Yeah, I guess um, just in case we want to keep the meeting short, I know uh, Chris uh, Lindstrom should be here soon and Tate hopefully will be here soon too. Yep, there's two in the in the waiting room. Because and it, Eve yeah. was going to come too, so I say we yeah, just get didn't, she Oh, and didn't Anna's here too, so we can Remember let Anna, set them in? our dear yeah, counselor, Anna Devlin, Gothier, and uh, Eve. So because I am going to have to leave. At, yeah, I need to leave uh, too at six thirty. My so. family has a birthday tonight, and they would love it if I wasn't on <laughs> meetings all night. It's not my birthday, but if it was my birthday, I'd stay. But, <laughs> Um, okay. Hey. Hi, Anna. Thank you for joining us. Sorry we had Zoom snafus. No Guilford has saved us. So. Well, Guilford didn't read the email. You got to make sure you tell him when you change. And and we like, we highlighted it. I like assume everybody's saying the same unless you, per yeah. I get it. I mean, how many emails do you get, huh? Yeah, so, a couple sorry hundred a day. Okay. All right, let's um, proceed. So we just I, had the yeah call to order. So do we want to order. public, public um, comment? Yeah, and I guess um, because uh, our our fine counselor, Devin Goffier, is here and that item is on our agenda, I mean, I guess I would ask, especially now, because we only have this half um, hour long meeting, that we move ahead and we um, do that. We the could talk lights. with her speakly about the streetlights and then... Um, let her go and yeah. if we want to talk further because one thing as I mentioned in the email is that um, Mary Jo Henneke is not available tonight because she's on other meetings tonight and she was you know one of the sponsors of this as well so um, I appreciate Anna being here to like you know give us a quick overview but I don't want to you know take up Anna's time and um and I think too, I mean, one thing as a committee, I think it would be good. To, I mean, I know I have quite a few comments, but if we want to send some comments ourselves before um, before they come back and meet with us in March, I think that would be great. And that would give them, you know, some feedback in advance and hopefully they can respond to our questions then. So does that sound like a good plan to everybody? And then just because in case people do need to leave early, so... Um, so one of the reasons that Mary Jo Henneke couldn't be here is because she has CRC meetings typically on Thursday nights as well. Um, and so, so one of the things is that we typically meet on the first and the third Thursdays. And, um, but that's also when she has the CRC meetings. And we also are trying to avoid the TSO meetings. There's a lot of meetings on Thursdays as people probably realize, but um, so we could just commit to having our next meeting on March 9th, Thursday, March 9th, which would be the second Thursday, then that would get rid of that conflict. And March is actually a month, I guess there's four th four Thursdays, no, five Thursdays, right? The second, the ninth, the 16th, the 23rd, and the 30th, five Thursdays. So we could maybe meet on the second and the fourth Thursdays, which would probably work better anyway, because the third Thursday is during the college spring break. So if that sounds like a plan, I just, I want to get people's okay. And then we'll just go ahead and move forward. Does that sound good? Yes. Okay. And why don't we, I don't know, should we switch back to 530? Because it seems like this five yeah. o'clock thing maybe created more issues than it's worth. And so, yeah. All right. Let's switch back. So 530. On March right. 9th? March 9th. Yes. And then the, the, uh, the next day after that would be the, the 23rd. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.
All right, uh, take it away. Uh, me, me take it away? Yes. Yep, yes. go ahead. Thank you. So, uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. I want to start off by just saying this is one of two times that we'll be coming. Well, Mandy will be here next time. Um, and so the goal of today is really to hear your questions. I may not have, I most likely will not be responding to most of them, but um, really just to walk through the, uh, the proposal. I, I think there might be some, some confusion, too, about the two pieces. And so I want to clarify that. And um, and here questions so that we might be able to find some answers before uh, before March 9th. So this uh, this proposal began with Mandy, um, who had heard a lot from some of her constituents. She's an at large counselor, so everyone is is her constituent. Um, heard from some constituents about streetlights shining into windows and um, and onto lawns in a way that was really disruptive to uh, their well being. Um, and isn't necessarily what streetlights are designed for. And Mandy began to look into it um, and learned about the risks that, that streetlights can have and the impacts that they can have on human health. Um, in addition, she learned about the impacts they can have on our, our natural environment, um, animals, plants, et cetera, et cetera. So if you wanna go way back and read our original sponsor memo, um, that might be helpful. And I apologize, I should have sent it to include in the packet because this was a while ago now. Um, but the sponsor memo in the initial presentation includes some imagery and um, some rationale behind some of what we are pitching today. Um, what you're seeing and what was in your packet is a two part uh, proposal. Initially, we had sent this all together as one piece. And in our discussions with TSO, we decided to split it into two. So there's really part one, which is more the technical elements of lighting. And then there's part two, which is redoing the lighting zones across town. So to be clear, um, if you're scrolling down, let's see, part B um, is not what's being proposed today. So we are just focusing on the first part. Yeah, Tracy. Oh, you're muted. Sorry, perhaps you want to share your screen with us? Sure, one second. Let me just if that if that's not too much information for people. But yeah, yeah. As as you're as you're talking about scrolling through, <laughs> you could show us the scrolling. Sure, I had figured everybody had the packet up. Yep, no problem. There actually isn't a packet. Oh, how do you get your meeting materials? We usually email them. Ah. Um, I'm not allowed to share my screen. Oh yeah, I can. Here it is. Okay. Gilford should let you. Yeah, I got it. Guilford, you just let me do anything, right? It's, not uh, right? it's actually set up that way. See, that's the true answer. All right, so um, here we go. Everybody seeing it? Okay, so um, this, is the, this is the part that we're talking about. It outlines the purpose of this, the definitions. I'm gonna try not to make anybody motion sick going through. Um, lots of definitions. This is pretty technical stuff here. And so it's important to try to be really clear with folks uh, about what we're talking about, what we're talking about. It's late and it's Thursday. Um, so, and then we get into the second part, which is, starts here, um, starts on page seven. Again, this is not what we're talking about today. So if you have questions on this, um, I encourage you to save them. We will probably be bringing this back at a later date, but it's it's not going to be helpful to kind of inter inter uh, twine them right now. So Tracy, I'm not sure what would be more helpful for you is to go through line by line or just to have general comments first. Sure. Um, okay. So so I will admit that um, unfortunately I did not distribute this to the members very far in advance, so I'm not even sure. Um, how much people have had a chance to look at it. I mean, do we want like a show of hands how much people have looked at it? Sure, so everybody can see. Much. Okay, Marcus has looked at it. Anybody? Good job, Marcus. So, I mean, I can, I have looked at it extensively. I had looked at the first version that came out in August extensively and I sent um, the council my comments then. I mean, this just got referred to TAC for the first time from the TSO, the Town Services and Outreach Committee, um, because one of the counselors said, well, you should get tax input. I mean, one of the members of TSO, who are all counselors, one of them said that you should get tax input. And then somebody else said, oh, you should also get the Disability Access Advisory Committee's input. But it's been floating around for six months. Um, so I've thought about it quite a bit. I can, I mean, I 
I could send a, like a you know a lengthy email about like my comments, but I I I'd be happy to kind of lead it off with some general ones. Does that sound good to people? And then if I get too much in the weeds, please stop me and I will send those in an email. Um, so I mean, I'll just say in general. So um, this has been proposed. This has been presented. Um, it was presented to the council in August, and then it was presented to TSO in November, and then it came back um, to TSO last week. Um, and in between the November time and the last week is when that second section about the locations of streetlights, that whole second part got, um, you know, put on the back burner for now. I mean, I would feel more comfortable if some of the language in that section at the, the heading of that section doesn't just say like for future discussion, maybe it could just say it's like on hold for now or something because it makes it sound like it's still sort of living right now. And um, but we'll be because I do, I mean, those were my more, those, a lot of my main concerns were about that section. Um, and I guess say um, from listening to the TSO discussion last week, so one of the things that's come up is so I know so, I mean, this proposal was put together by the two counselors, and they also consulted extensively with James Lowenthal, who used to be an Amherst resident. Um, he's a big cyclist, and um, he is also an astronomy professor at Smith College. He now lives in Northampton, um, and he is a very active in the dark skies movement and reducing light pollution in general. Um, and he has consulted other communities about dark skies and to promote dark skies. And so when I hear the TSO um, meeting, like the discussions, and, um, and Mr. Lowenthal was a panelist at last week's TSO meeting, but a lot of the comments, you know, by the proponents are talking about that this is all being done to promote human health. And from the very beginning, one of my concerns has been, it really seemed like the proposal was not really looking at the adverse health impacts of darkness on traffic safety, on pedestrian safety, on bicyclist safety, on the safety of other vulnerable populations. Um, I think in the initial slide presentation that was made to the council in the first TSO meeting, you know, it's just, it's very minimally discussed. And those are really real risks. Um, about, only about a third of, um, I believe it's like a third of, uh, vehicle miles traveled are at night, but um, over half of the traffic fatalities are at night. 75% of pedestrian fatalities are after dark. Um, also, the pedestrian fatalities and bicycle fatalities are um, predominantly among, well, not predominantly, but disproportionately among um, minority populations in low income neighborhoods and areas without, you know, different. Um, infrastructure, including good lighting. I mean, the last few days I've been listening to um, a federal highway um, traffic safety forum that's been conducted online. And in their section about nighttime visibility and safety, they say that nighttime visibility is a huge issue. You know, they had sessions on um, lighting, lighting visibility at intersections, lighting visibility at crosswalks. And the little clips they show, I mean, there's a number, I mean, there are a number of like one to two minute videos and they all start with the reality that over 75% of pedestrian deaths happen at night. And that the, you know, these disadvantaged populations are disproportionately impacted and the pedestrian deaths and pedestrian deaths at night have been on the rise. So I'm coming at it from that perspective. I mean, I do really much appreciate, you know, wanting to decrease light pollution, but I'm also thinking about all the lives that are being lost um, by, inadequate lighting at night. And it really is an issue. And it's an issue both in terms of, I mean, there's a safety issue for like older drivers, for example, for um, like latest vehicle technologies. So part of my background is that I, you know, do driver research. I used to be the driving, um, the lab manager at a driving simulator lab about what um, drivers see, you know, how drivers respond, what they don't see. And there's a lot of evidence about that older drivers don't see as well at night. I don't see as well at night. I'm not even <laughs> that old. And, um, and the pedestrians and bicyclists really overestimate how visible they are. And drivers overestimate how well they can see pedestrians and bicyclists. Um, so I'm kind of coming at it from that perspective. But I can, um, I can pause Casey, for a do you have any specific areas you want to focus on 
I mean, um, I know we have like until six thirty, yeah, so no, I, okay. I kind of want to keep this. So I guess I one keep it focused. Yeah. So one of the things um, that I was still concerned about, even if we removed that second section, was the section G three in the new proposal. So, and this is carryover language from the current um, streetlights policy. The current streetlights policy was approved in two thousand and one. Um, so it's been over twenty. It's tw over twenty years old, and. Um, so on section three, you know, G3, it says about that streetlights will not be provided by the town as security lighting for private property. I agree with that 100 percent. And then also saying that streetlights will not be provided for pedestrians in residential neighborhoods unless one of the above criteria is met or the town council otherwise deems the situation to require a streetlight. Um, and so that's a little bit con that's concerning to me because I would rather this policy like stays silent on the issues of pedestrians in residential neighborhoods i do think i mean there there are a lot of there are a lot of residential neighborhoods that don't have a lot of night lighting and um well, well I, I would say I, I, that it's not clear what the above criteria are that's that is a factor as well I mean, that's to me is more the focus, right? Is what the criteria are we talking about? Are we talking about something in F or in A or you know what? So yeah, maybe before Anna can we kind of get that. there, yeah, I can. Sure. So it would be um, in one through three, one through two. So or I guess really one. So it's basically if there is a, an intersection where there is not currently a light, or um, if you know it's a mid block location. So. Uh, it's essentially saying that if if it's not up to the standard level that is set in G1, that that's where they could be added. Um, Tracy, to, to confirm what you're saying, your preference would be, are you saying that you would prefer uh, that anybody who requests the streetlight is able to get one where they would no, like? No, I'm not suggesting that. I'm just, I don't like the language that's saying that we will not provide lighting for pedestrian safety. I would rather that not be part of the bylaw. Well, like so I think that our kind of expectations and our goals as a community have changed in the last 20 years. And I'd like us to be more supportive of pedestrians, including pedestrians at night. Yeah, I, I do hear that. Um, and I guess I'm concerned at, or I'm confused at how G1D uh, doesn't cover that, which is pedestrian traffic, heavy pedestrian traffic. I mean, but the reality to me is that um, I'll let other people speak to it. I mean, the reality to me is that like, people are walking in all neighborhoods, right? First of all, you have this heavy pedestrian traffic. I'm not sure what that term heavy means. It's very subjective. And some of it also varies, you know, by time of year. I mean, you have certain student neighborhoods that don't have a lot um, at other times, you know, during the summer and so on. But also just, you know, in any kind of, I mean, there's so many residential neighborhoods where, you know, people are walking their dogs or people are, you know, don't, I mean, I mean, a lot of, you know, student neighborhoods, people don't have cars and people. So I guess I'd rather just, it's not just heavy pedestrian traffic. It's just like, why? I guess I'd rather it's just remain silent. We don't have to have lights everywhere. Um, but just like, why are we saying we will not, why are we saying that lights, street lights will not be provided in pedestrian neighborhoods? Like that's of what's concerned to me. Okay, so, so help me work through this here. Um, so if we don't say it, then the assumption and the requirement would be that we do provide them upon request. Um, and that was something that, and I guess I'll defer to Guilford a bit here, is something that the town was not interested in doing because of the disparity and honestly, and who knows how to engage enough to get one. And um, because of just the, the kind of control issue of kind of how many lights that we're putting out there. Um, and so if we don't specify that we're not going to do it, it's fair to say that we would do it. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out what the ideal medium would be in but it doesn't it doesn't it just says that you know where are the in section g but it says one street light shall be located at all road intersections mm -hmm. and the street lights at mid-block locations will be space and interval appropriate as determined by the dpw um and at locations deemed hazardous i mean a lot of these residential neighborhoods you know, if you look at like Orchard Valley, I mean, a lot of them mainly just have um, streetlights, I believe, at the intersections currently. And also the way I read the current version of the bylaw is it's not because you remove that second section, it's not saying that streetlights will all be removed. What it's doing is it's just saying we're, you know, this is talking about new placement of streetlights. So if, if there wasn't, if the language wasn't there that said we will not provide 
streetlights in pedest in for pedestrians in residential neighborhoods. I don't see that that's a problem because I'm not seeing anywhere where it's saying we're going to have streetlights all over the place. Okay, so my I'm, notes are concerned about G3, doesn't like that pedestrian safety isn't a reason to get a streetlight, wants us to take out the language that says the town will not provide. That, that, that's that's my take on it, but let, I'd, I'd like um, to hear what other people say on the time. Um, Stefan has had his hand up for a while. Uh, thanks. So I just have some clarified questions. I know you said we're not focusing on, uh, sorry, I'm scrolling through as I speak, uh, right. sponsor part B. Um, so just a quick question. I know we're not going to focus on it, but you mentioned some codes here that just threw me off, like LZ, LZ0, LZ, or sorry, L, yeah, LZ0, LZ1, LZ2. Are these, Those are these, are these sorry, uh, wait one sec, the following zoning districts shall be in LZ0, RO, RL, like, do you have a map of all of these zones of the town or because I see earlier it says the town shall maintain under I1 bottom of page five the town shall maintain the official map of the location of the town streetlights can we get I don't know if that's more of a DPW question or Anna you have one but can we also get that map of the if you have one so I'll I'll turn to Guilford for the current map of the streetlights um the all of the LZs would be part of that section too um, it's probably not going to be helpful for me to send that to you right now because we're going to rework okay. it. Um, does okay. that answer that? But it's saying uh, like, yes. it's like creating where in town things would be. Um, there is no, no. one reference left in the first section that that uh, ties back to it. And we've um, flagged that. We just haven't had a new version out to, to committees yet. Okay, yeah, I just want clarification. And then the other thing I was going to ask and, um, for the top portion that we're all discussing right now. So mm -hmm. this... Uh, this isn't a current policy, what we're seeing above. Is this a proposed one? And if so, what is the current one? Because obviously there's criteria here, like we're going to place a streetlight if criteria A, B, C, D are met or, or you know, whatever. Um, like under G, I think I mentioned, you know, so this is proposed, right? Uh, yeah. Is there a current one? And if yeah. so, can we see how that differs? It's page 10 um, in the... Oh, okay. Yep, it's the last page. The last page. Yeah, so the, the question that uh, G3 that is basically a copy and paste from the previous, from the current standard, right? Yes. Right. Anna, yeah. Yep. I see it now. Okay. Great. That's all I had. Maybe. Okay. It's okay. short. It's much shorter. <laughs> so. Yep. It doesn't. Yeah, it's a one pager. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, and, oh, yes. No, no. Um, Eve had her, has had her hand up for a while too. Hi, so and I just want to say I'm not actually officially on the committee any, anymore. I was on the committee for about 10 years, so I've been involved in these discussions for a long, long time. And I currently have a column in the Indy that I'm trying to do on um, transportation mode shift in Amherst um, and how we um, really need to be working on promoting people getting out of their individual private cars and onto bikes and um, walking and, and taking the bus. So in that context, in both contexts of being on the TAC and, and its predecessor committees and, and really thinking about how do we get about a mode shift, I, I mean, honestly, I have advocated for exactly the opposite of what you were advocating for. I'm very sympathetic to the idea of um, night skies. I live next to a big UMass field. I love seeing the stars. But and I'm no expert on street lighting, but my understanding is there are ways to do street lighting that provide visibility for bicyclists and pedestrians, but don't blare into the night the way you know traditional lights do. And in my opinion, that's what we need to be looking at. We need to be not saying no lights because it is dangerous. Um, you know, there was a person killed on North Pleasant a few years ago, got out of the bus, wasn't seen. Um, there was a person killed not that many years before that on East Street walking along two people side by side wasn't seen hit by a car killed there's a person all, uh, killed on university at night not seen you know um we have multiple pedestrian deaths not just statistics nationally but here in amherst and we have you know five thousand new residents who come in every year who don't know to like wear bright clothing and we're not going to get them all to do it and we want them to be biking, we want them to be walking, we want them to be taking transit and not bringing individual cars, every single one of them. So we need to be like, I, I don't know if you've, you've biked up, I bike up on East Pleasant, right? 
if, if you go at night up East Pleasant and you get to the point just past Eastman, there's this total um, dark spot where I can't even see the road. You know, and literally, like, if there's a new pothole or there's gravel there, like, I could easily die riding my bike. And I have, like, ridden, you know, driven many, many times when there's pedestrians walking because we don't have sidewalks on all of these streets, right? So even at night, they're walking in the road. And, and you know, the, the undergraduates are not all going to be, you know, take the lane, um, you know, spandex wearing you know, reflective gear wearing people at night, it really is fundamental street lights. Or um, I don't know if you've looked at the walk reports we did as a committee a few years ago, we walked and did um, the North Pleasant route. There's so many spots and there's so many student housing up and down that street where people are walking, where we need more lights, not less. Um, so, you know, I'm not on this committee, but I will be, you know, writing comments, but I really think that a misguided um, approach to, to try to forbid lighting. I think the right approach is to say, how do we do both? How do we create a lighting system where we've got lighting that's going to be regular um, and low level, right? Maybe it's, you know, I don't know if motion detects, I don't know what the technology is, but we've got to find a way to have a dark sky and safety lighting, not ex one exclusive of the other. May I respond, please? Um, sure. And then Stefan. Yeah, thank you. So I'm not clear on where the idea that this policy is banning all lighting in town is coming from, because Eve, to be honest with you, it's doing everything that you're saying. It is um, it's setting up our, our lights to have a certain number of pins so that when we do upgrade them eventually, they could be motion detectors. It's limiting the amount of spread. It's pointing them down. It's doing all of that. So I'm, I'm, a, little, I'm a little perplexed by the idea that this is banning all streetlights. Um, the, the idea of the zones is where it would get to the point where we would be removing them from certain areas. But the, the purpose of this first section and what it outlines is really about um, more, much more about the fixtures and the way that our lighting functions. I also would like to be very clear that this uh, is only for um, streetlights that are in the public way. We will not be addressing UMass at all. Um, they, that is separate, so we can't do that. I am a cyclist. Um, I'm, I am an avid cyclist, and so I do understand what you're saying. I also think that there's significant education that needs to happen around road safety. Um, you know, unless and, and, and if this is something that you want to pitch either as a resident or if, uh, as TAC of illuminating everything, then that's a that's you're welcome to pitch that. Um, but I think that there aren't a lot of places in this town where you can currently go for a long ride or a long walk at night without needing individual lighting. And I think it's really important that we're educating our residents on that safety element uh, as well. So I think that I, I would really encourage folks as you're reading through this to separate the first part and the second. The council, when we vote, will be will be voting on just this first part. Um, and if Mandy and I rework the second, that will be that will be go through the entire process uh, again. So um, as you look through, we talk about the level of light, the warmth of light, the sky glow, the um, type of fixture, and the um, pins. <clears throat> excuse me. The pins, um, and that—that's the part that would let it be dimmable in the future if we did upgrade the the actual bulbs themselves. Um, and then I also wanted to go back to something at the beginning too, which is, you know, we we have done a lot of a lot of the research as well. Mandy and I, I think, are known for not um, not ignoring details. And so the other thing to really that's really important to note here is, um, you know, you gave the example of the person stepping off the bus. It's this this policy is very clear that um, bus stops are lit, right? And so there are some there are some things that are, you know, we're trying to mitigate um, to to think with that safety mindset as much as possible. We also know that data wise, um, most of those accidents at night are are drunk drivers, and so it's really important to recognize. Tracy, I see you. I see you. Um, so a significant number, I'll say a significant number if that feels better, a significant number of the accidents are, are um, folks under the influence and distracted drivers. And so it's really important to also recognize other ways that we can be promoting safety as well. Um, correlation does not equal causation and I will, I will uh, happily fight that fight. Um, I'm not saying that there isn't a link, but it cannot be the, it, we cannot act as if it is the only link. Um, so I just wanted to kind of check that a little bit here. So. Um, 
that's the the main thing is that this first part of the policy is really not it's not about removing lighting it's about uh, making our lighting efficient and safe in terms of uh, the human health and the health of the environment. But okay. I have written down your your uh, as much as your statement as I could capture, and I will address it with Mandy as well. And Stefan. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, I was just also going to say, uh, with respect to again going back to page four, section G, um, the location standards. I would also just throw in there because I know Tracy mentioned earlier. Uh, it said like. Uh, I just lost the wording, but it said like, oh, like high pedestrian, that's uh, yep. pedestrian traffic, and that could be subjective. I'd also just throw in there also like uh, the types of pedestrians that um, might be living in or, or frequently uh, traversing through there. So like, for example, what comes to mind for me is like the elderly population. Obviously, if you have one elderly person in a neighborhood of a thousand, like, you know, you know, you, but what I'm saying is like the vast majority, if there's a great amount, like, and also um, and that's, I'm sure it's more from an engineering standpoint, which I don't know anything about. Um, you know, you say like, uh, or it says in here, streetlights a mid-block location that is spacing and it will be appropriate. I would also be curious to see if that that uh, includes like uh, the different speed limits on streets, right? So if you have a street that's 25 miles an hour and a street that's 40, 45 miles an hour, uh, do we need to be putting more streetlights lights? Uh, in a quicker speed, is it, uh, sorry, in the, speed, in the areas where the speed limit's greater, what about street width types of lanes? You know, I'm, I'm sure there is, again, a formula, and I'm sure that is taking into consideration, but I'm just saying with respect to the policy, I think that should also be in there. Um, and then uh, with bus stops, I think that's also important. I also I actually work for UMass Transit Services, so I get to see this from a, as a driver and as a dispatcher, and I get to hear people calling in regarding buses missing them because they weren't seen in the bus stop. Uh, obviously, we talk about a big bus stop like Town Hall, Coles Lane, Post Office, those aren't really big factors because they're well lit there and they're those are actually the one three I just mentioned are mandatory bus stops where every bus has to stop there but um but when you look at uh uh east pleasant street between um um uh eastman lane and pine street that's a pretty lengthy stretch there are a lot of students walking southbound on that road towards um tilson farm in the uh, that stop up there and i see them because i drive to 33 a lot so i go through there a lot i see them even at night driving you have your high beams on uh and some of those are hard, hard to see some stops do have a little led light which blinks and that's provided by the pvta uh that's more so indicating to the driver that there's someone waiting there you know it's a it's you push the button almost like a crosswalk button and it flashes for i don't quite know how long maybe 10 minutes uh, to indicate someone's waiting but it's not made to actually show there's someone there uh, like illuminate them so I think just keeping that in mind and, and, and um, you know, where are people going from there? If, if a lot of people live in a certain neighborhood behind the bus stop, taking that into consideration. And I know you can't put a light at every person's house. I get that. Um, that don't want to be realistic um, or financially uh, feasible. But I just think that like looking at bus stops in general is, is a, a safety issue, is, a, is important to look at. And um, a lot of these just have the bike lane where people have to wait or in the, very narrow grassy area not a pull-off so the bus is stopping in the road or or hugging the bike lane where people are already waiting so that's something to take in mind but again the types of population what is the street being used for and and i guess the other more scientific aspects of it, like i said the speed the width all that so that's just what we're putting for especially for section g thank you and just to comment if i had my way about road widening and adding bike lanes and bus stops our roads would look different, but Guilford might kill me. So thank you. It's he might anyway, to be fair. So <laughs> next, uh Tracy, you had your um hand. I defer to I want to hear what Marcus has to say Marcus. since I've spoken before. Sorry. I, I was just gonna point out um one thing on uh I think Stefan actually mentioned some of this, you know, there's uh, some words in here that are very um hard to define. So a better definition will help, like, you know, what does heavy pedestrian foot traffic mean? You know, do you need to have a, a stampede or do you just have two people? Um, the other one was uh, G1, G1A. Um, I kind of bulk at just limiting it to one street light per intersection. I'd like it to be a bit more open, like, you know, at least one street light would be cool because not all... You know, not every intersection is made the same. Um, and if you're trying to limit uh, adverse lighting, you know, having more lights actually could have, be more helpful. So 
Is there, um, but, yeah. is there a size of intersection that you would recommend or you you said you would just want it to say at least? I'd say at least. And then, then because if you get too into the weeds on this sort of thing, you're going to be, you know, hamstringing yourself for special situations. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. There's no need to get too detailed on it. Are there any other things you said heavy pedestrian was one of the things that you wanted? Yeah, to I think there's just a uh, throughout, you know, there's just kind of use of heavy or okay. um, just various different things. It's just like, you know, maybe be more cognizant on some of the descriptors in here. Okay, if you find any other specific ones, please uh, let us know. Yes, I will. Christine. Am I next? Christine. Yes. I guess I am. Okay. Um, yeah, I just was, uh, I like this a lot and I think it's well um, thought through and I appreciate you um, also addressing some of Eve's concerns straight on in terms of, um, you know, from a pedestrian or a cyclist point of view, how this plays out. Uh, I just was also curious about maintenance, and I, I actually don't know how our current street lights are maintained and how much it costs to maintain them. Um, I'm assuming that that's all kind of in Guilford's budget each year, um, and things are maintained maybe on an ad hoc basis rather than like twice a year we go out and do X and Y with our street lights. And um, so I was just curious about the way maintenance occurs now and um, if any of these changes impact the amount of maintenance that we need to do or you know the amount of money that needs to be spent on maintenance um, with some of these kind of um, sort of newer criteria along what around what the street light is. The, the second part um, of this, if we bring it back, would impact that probably maybe a little bit more if we did remove streetlights. I also, I'm not sure I addressed Eve's uh, concerns as, as well as, as uh, she may have wanted me to, but um, I appreciate that. I guess Guilford's probably going to have a better answer in terms of cost, but that is something that we've, that TSO also asked for, and we'll be having more official reports on in terms of what the transition would cost. Um, and, and Guilford, when you answer, uh, if you could speak to this generally, but also that one street light on Wildflower, that'd be great. So the, the one on Wildflower, they went and looked at and it wasn't doing it. Okay, I will uh, so, look again. Um, so what we do right now is at least- Wait, but now I'm gonna go to Wildflower and look around. You know, hey, you got that's my goal, planting seeds here. Anyway. Well, so, I mean, it's weird because there's multiple things that affect street lights. Um, the older lights in Amherst Woods, Echo Hill, and Orchard Valley, and some of the developments that were, well, actually most of the developments in that same time period, um, there's wiring that is um, substandard and actually causes flickering, as well as the LE LEDs um, or the photocells. So once a year, at least once a year, we go out and do an inventory at night. So there's an inventory done at night to see which ones are on and which ones are off. Um, based on that, they do maintenance on those. There is no, we do not track when we replace a bulb or when we replace a fixture and then put in a new one. We just wait for it to have a problem because they go at different times. Um, we can buy a box of photo cells, a brand new box of photo cells and put, replace photo cells with them. And they'll be the first photo cells to go out again. Um, American supply chain, the American supply chain is not very reliable for parts like that anymore. So there's not a scheduled replacement. It's as needed. They can get replaced. So once a year, we do a, a townwide um, survey and mark down those ones that need to be replaced. And then we replace parts as they need to. And when people call in um, and the place to call and place to email is the public works office. It's not the assistant town manager's office. It's not the town manager's office. It's not the conservation or planning commission or whoever. It's you email public works and there's a, if you go to the website, it says that. Um, and then we can work on it because there's actually four, actually there's five people who own lights in the town of Amherst. There's the town, there's UMass, there's Amherst College, there's Mass Highway, 
and there's private lights. And all of them can be in the public way at the same time. So College Street, the town, uh, town only owns three lights down College Street between South Pleasant Street and the railroad bridge. But there's a light on every pole. The other ones belong to Amherst College. So as you talk about the public ways, those lights will be affected, but those are owned by, well, they're owned by Eversource and they're rented by Amherst College. North Pleasant Street through the campus, the public way, almost every light down there is owned by the university. When you get to, there's a lot of places like that in town, they're kind of the same. Um, Lincoln Avenue, no, Sunset Avenue, no, Lincoln, sorry, Lincoln Avenue, there's a neighbor who owns a light on Lincoln Avenue because they didn't want it turned off in 1991. Um, the street light policy at the bottom of their proposed street light policy, it says it was voted in 2001, but that's actually just a reapproval of the policy from 1991 when we actually turned off two thirds of the street lights in Amherst. So there's not, there wasn't a lot of real thought put in that policy except that they were cutting, cutting the budget in 91. Um, and just turning off street lights. Um, but that's how we do it. So it's, um, I actually am about to send Anna some inf some questions about the maintenance section, but um, it, there is no map. We can put a map together. We have an inventory. Um, but but Gilford, um, do you see this new policy as like negatively impacting the bottom line? Well, if, when we go to the smart lights, when you go to the smart lights, it's just like um, putting a, a cell phone in every every street light. So one is your technology in the lights more expensive. Two, you have to have a subscription per light to actually talk to the light, just like each one of us have a subscription to talk on our cell phones. And to and how many lights are there in town approximately? There's a few hundred. And this is not, we wouldn't be putting the smart bulbs in. We what what this policy does is at this point is enables the fixtures if we did decide in the future to use those smart lights um, down again down the road because we know that they're so expensive. But this gives us the option to not have to change out all the fixtures. So so Guilford, I had a question to um about the um, the utility poles, the lights with utility poles. Um, I mean, sorry, the utility poles that have the lights, you know, particularly like when Eversource was um, putting in those taller poles, like all over town, including I know on my street, lots of streets. But one of the things I noticed is that when they were switching from the one pole to the other pole, and in fact, in a lot of places were still both poles, but when the street lights were being switched over, a lot of times the street light height was increasing. And so, I mean, I did have the practical question with this proposed policy where it's talking about that all the street lights should be at a certain height. And I was, I've been told that the town doesn't have total say over at what height the street lighting is on is located on the Eversource poles. Like, could you speak to that a little bit? Because maybe, I mean, if a lot of the street lights we have are on Eversource poles. I'm not sure how much that's under the town's control. So around uh, around 14, 13 to 14 feet is the where wires start appearing on the pole. Um, and that kind of corresponds to the, it actually corresponds to the height of the official highest vehicle can go that can go down a road. And that might be a little low on the number. Uh, so that's where the first wire is, and that's the Verizon wire or your telephone wire. And then every they try to space the wires out every foot. So on some poles, you may have Verizon. Um, then you'll have Town of Amherst. Actually, you won't have Town of Amherst. You'll have Verizon. You'll have five college fiber. And then there's another fiber company in town. And then there's then next you'll get the Comcast. So if you see like four wires that are basically look like they're communication wires, that's what those are. Um, Verizon sometimes has two wires or three wires on a pole, and they're all they're all hopefully spaced apart, a foot apart. And then you get to the municipal section of the pole, and in the municipal section of the pole, you can have a fiber line for the town. Um, you may see the old um, fire 
box system still hanging on the poles, mm -hmm. the old poles. You'll see the two wires for the fire alarm system. Um, and then you'll see a street light. And the street light and all is all in that municipal zone. And then you see the secondary power zone. And then you see the high high voltage power zone going up. So street lights are powered from the secondary. So they have to be the the area mm -hmm. below the secondary. So they won't be any lower than where the secondaries are by for Verizon or for Eversource because we have to power off that. So basically if the pole gets higher, so do our lights. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The only uh, ones we can control can control are the um the decorative lights we have around town or the individual poles we have around town, you, we can set the height of those poles. Yeah. yeah. So in like section, for example, in section E6 of the proposed policy, right, it says that the maximum height of all the streetlight luminaries will be 25 feet from the roadway surface. Is that realistic? Like given what you're telling me about that it starts at 14 to 15 feet with horizon and then all the other things. <laughs> Um, we we might be a little higher than that on some of the newer poles. They're they're putting in some 50s and 60s now, um, so we might be a little higher. Okay. Um, so, and then I did have. I mean, I have some. Thanks for explaining that because it was really confusing to me about the poles. And so, what percentage of the um. I mean, just approximately like what percentage of the streetlights in town are on the Eversource poles compared to the town poles? Um, it's probably 90% are on a, well, on I didn't a, just take that back. It's probably 80% are on Eversource okay. poles. Okay, on Eversource poles. All right. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, so a few, um, a few things I was looking for some clarifications on. And I think, too, I mean, speaking more on, what some people were saying about how it would be good to have more clear definitions. So one definition I had questions about, it seems quite subjective, is the definition of light pollution, which is definition number 10 in the definition section on page two. Mm -hmm. And so light pollution is defined as any adverse or obtrusive, obtrusive effect of the use of outdoor lighting at night, also any inappropriate or excessive use of artificial light. So I think that that, that speech seems pretty um pretty subjective in terms of like i might think that more light is better or somebody might say like no light is better and so on so if we are going to use that term light pollution maybe we want to have a more objective definition of it um and then looking at i did have questions back to oh on section e again i had questions about the street and this is something i had brought up to the TSO earlier about the street lights, the streetscape lighting. Well, first of all, I had questions about where the streetscape lighting zones are considered to be, because there is a new definition now about village centers. And speaking um, to what Stefan was talking about earlier, like it is talking about the municipal parking district and the village centers that you should have streetscape lighting, but there are other areas that also do have um, heavy pedestrian traffic. Um, like, for example, like the municipal parking district, you know, it doesn't, for example, extend up North Pleasant Street through campus, which is where he was talking about that fatality. Mm -hmm. um, it's quite limited. It doesn't extend along Triangle Street. I mean, so one thing you could look at is you could look at the um, the 2019 Amherst Bicycle and Pedestrian Network Plan, because we did identify what were the priority pedestrian corridors and maybe in include increased lighting there. Um, and then there's also this section under, I guess it's G, no, 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 under, um, sorry, under E4B about the streetscape lighting shall be dimmed to no more than 70% of normal luminescence levels by 11 p.m. or after the closing time of the last bar live music venue. So one thing about that is, um, I mean, there are, you know, there are some parts of town that are pretty quiet late at night um, or after 11 p.m., but there are other parts that are not. Some of the buses in Amherst, the PBTA buses, the UMass Transit buses, they run until 1 a.m. Um, and and near UMass, 11 p.m. is not like when everything is shutting down. In some cases, it's when everything is getting started. 
So I was kind of questioning that. Also, because like some of those areas, like the UMA, the areas where a lot of UMass students live are outside of the municipal parking district or the village centers as they've been defined. So I, I think it might be preferable to use some of the major pedestrian corridors for part of that definition. And also, um, I was curious about why 70% um, was chosen. Um, okay. And uh, I think, and then, yeah, that was, I think, the main part. And then again, so I just, again, had the questions just about, um, like, back to Section G where we were talking. I do agree with what Marcus said about one streetlight shall be located all the roadway intersections, particularly if we're serving larger intersections. I think it could be more appropriate to have more. Um, and again, it also depends on what type of lighting, like, for example, if you are in the streetscape area. I noticed, for example, at um, University Drive South and Route 9 that Barry Roberts' new development has, like, um, low-level streetscape lighting. It's Thanks. actually, like, path. It's a path, and it's, like, very well lit, and I, it's great. Tracy, Tracy, hang on. I, I think are we, we're going kind of a little okay. all over the place. Can we... You had a bunch of questions. I, I hope we can get those answered. So, oh, go ahead. I have some answers for you. Um, Great, a couple, and and I'm I'm furiously typing. I apologize if folks are are hearing that in the background. So, okay, um, the bike and pedestrian plan. That's one of the reasons why we are relooking at the second part of this. Um, is that you know it's something that we've both read, but we didn't like lay it over the initial zones, and so. Um, we will be doing that as we look at the initial zones and I'm hearing you about um, the main corridors on this to, to talk about what the streetscape area specifically it sounds like. Um, the, um, the 70% I believe is based on uh, both best practices um, from different lighting groups or something like that and also when we were benchmarking this and looking at other areas, what made sense in terms of still being able to see, but also still dimming. So um, that that's my that's my recollection of why 70% was chosen. But if I get a, a more clear answer, I will um, share that with you. The other things I don't necessarily have answers for right now, but um, I have written them down. All right. And Eve, did you have another question? Just a brief comment that the um, the network map was never updated after the attack had a series of meetings to mark it up. So that's never been completed and that would be a good thing to finish up. Were there significant changes that might, that should impact this in your mind? I think so. I mean, one of the things that we thought about a lot is like which bike routes are only for the strong, able, larger bicyclists and which are going to be for, you know, kids and, and experienced bicyclists and, and the latter would really require much more lighting than the former. Um, and there were a few where we were like, wait, the, the draft had things going through neighborhoods where we, later we were like, no, that would only be a pedestrian route. So there were several, yeah, instances where I think it would matter. Sorry, I think I froze for a second, Eve. I got the unstable warning. Um, you had said the former and then it broke up. I'm so sorry. Could you repeat yourself, please? So um, so the two different kinds of bicyclists we were looking oh, at. I got that part. That part. Yep. The second is that there were some places where, um, so the initial map was just based on um, like a public meeting that we had where people drew on maps. Mm -hmm. and there were a few routes that like went through neighborhoods that later on people were like, no, 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 that doesn't make any sense. So there were actually some like geographical changes where routes either got added or taken off between um, okay. that map. And, and so the fine, what's called the final bicycle and pedestrian plan does not actually have the final map. I think if I'm not mistaken, the, the community input information is online, right? Because I remember looking at that. Um, yeah, so the community input information is what informed the map that's in there. Not the new one that's not out yet? Or that's not what happened with right. the then the TAC had a series of meetings to mark up that map and say, this is what should it really oh, be? Okay. I understand. And, and that those markups never got onto a GIS map and into a PDF. Gotcha. And, Thank you. and that's on our agenda too. So we could transition over there because I know we're trying to end this meeting in 10 minutes, but 
So this was a lot of really helpful stuff. Um, Mandy and I are happy to hear any other questions. Um, and and uh, if the sooner you get them to us, the better so that we can uh, come with more answers for March 9th. But um, I appreciate you all taking a, a look at this. All right. Well, we appreciate you coming and answering questions. Eve, Thank did you. you have something else? Yeah, I just had a question. Um, so I didn't get a chance to read the proposed policy, but it sounds like you're being really prescriptive. And and I'm just I'm curious about your approach. Why take that approach of being more prescriptive rather than like setting out a set of kind of, you know, this is the, the level of lighting kind of standard that we want because of course, technology changes over time, right? And what you prescribe now, if a, you, the last policy was in 91, so that's been how long? Over 30 years. You know, 30 years from now, there might be very, very different technology. So what's the point in being so prescriptive in a policy? Sure. So if you look at our other policies, if you want to look at the water and sewer regulations and things like that, they tend to be much more prescriptive. They tend to be more scientific. They tend to really clearly specify because if they don't do it there, there isn't any other place that they would be necessarily that specific. Um, bylaws tend to be more general, but when you get into regulation and policy, it really does, you know, typically our, our regulations on things specify as clearly as possible the standards um, that we expect to be upheld and they can be revisited. Um, and, and that was something that was brought up as well of, of including a cadence for how often we would be revisiting this. Um, but that's that's kind of the explanation is because it's a policy, not a bylaw. So it, it, those tend to be more prescriptive and specific. Also, because there's a lot of subjectivity in being less specific. And if there's goals that we're trying to meet and things we really want to see, we feel that being. Yeah, I guess I would think, um, you know, I work on state policy, not on sure. local, so I don't know, you know, but I think of the legislature as passing more of the, the standards and then the, the agency, so the, the you know, the staff being more in the regulatory details, but um, in this case, it seems like you could have an outcome-based set of standards rather than a technology-based set of standards. So the, the counselor, uh, the council is the keeper of the public way, and so we're doing it in that capacity. Um, we, we're, that's part of the council responsibility as keepers of the public way um, is to do things about the public way. Um, so that's that's why, I mean, I think that, you know, I, I guess maybe we just disagree on the outcomes versus specificity part and maybe Mandy has a different answer. I think that what we've found is um, we we found that being specific is, is more helpful to folks in terms of actually giving guidance versus sort of vague ideas. Um, but I'm also happy to hear disagreement on that too um that's yeah that's it. i mean so i when i attended um part of the last tso meeting right there were comments from some of the counselors that's talking about um like why is this so detailed and shouldn't we just allow like dpw to do its job and not i mean i do i mean i can understand wanting to have more specificity than the one page current policy but i mean i but it does seem too that, I mean, just as Eve was saying, like the current policy is over 20 years old. And so like how often, like how detailed should the policy be? I mean, how much should be left to DPW's discretion and how often, if it's a very detailed policy, how much, um, how often would it need to get updated? And I also just have a related just question about policies in general. Um, and part of it was in light of the GOL's recent discussion about the snow and ice bylaw. And also, um, and this is in terms of like, where are all these policies that the town has? Like, is there, I was actually looking on the town website about, are the policies like under different departments? Are they all under the town council? Um, I thought of it because GOL was just discussing, as I said, the snow and ice bylaw. And I've always heard, for example, that you know, adjacent property owners are required to cut back their bushes and stuff, like stay out of the public way, but that's not actually in the bylaws. And I couldn't actually find that as a written policy anywhere. So, I mean, like um, a resident who, you know, doesn't come to all these meetings, like where would they even find all the policies? It's sort of an outreach information question. So I don't expect you to have the answer. It's just more of a general question about where do they all live and <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I where do people see those? I Google them, and that's how I find them. Um, so I just I know all the bylaws live in a single spot. Um, Guilford, do you hold your your current and existing policy, or is that 
is um, I'm trying to find. So there is a website that is town policies that are have been adopted by the council. Um, I was just trying to pull it up, but my internet is being uncooperative. Yeah, they're trying to they're trying to bring it all back together. It got dispersed, um, but they're trying to bring it all back together. And actually, there's been changes to bylaws that we don't even know about. The you were talking about the not blocking the sidewalk and not letting your plant your growth your plants encroach on the sidewalk. That it was in a bylaw when I first got here. That was in the bylaws, and it's not in there now. Someone took it out, um, and there's oh. no there's no history of who took it wow. out. Wow, was taken out. So they're they're trying to organize this stuff a little better. Athena's doing a really good job trying to organize it, but right now it's basically Athena doing it. Um, so that's how it's going. But even like the current street slot lights policy, right? Like, so as Anna said, like if I Google it, I can find the current street lights policy. But if I would said, hey, what are the DPW policies? Like, I don't know where they are. You, anyway, you, have, to so wand, just, you have to wander through to find them. Okay. <laughs> valid, valid question, Tracy. So, all right. Thank You're you. Thank Great. you. And I, we're going to end in a couple minutes. So thank you so much for coming tonight. That's very helpful. Yeah. Um, I think y'all have my email, so feel free to email Mandy and I with anything else that comes up. Appreciate it. Hey, thanks. Bye-bye. Okay. Um, so we did want to end the meeting pretty soon. Um, are there any other... I, I would be happy to talk for a few minutes about the bicycle and pedestrian plan and see if we can get that moving again, but is there anything else that anybody want to discuss before we adjourn? Seems like not. So we, oh. just to confirm that our next meetings are March 9th at 5.30 and Mar March 23rd at 5.30. Just confirming that before we move. Yes. That sounds, I'm just thinking you, you, got, you should have a process. It sounds like they want feedback from the TAC that might be official before March 9th. You guys might want to have a process where you draft some comments, Tracy, and send them out to the committee and people write back to you before you send out official comments from the TAC. I'm just I'm just trying to think that you should you should plan some kind of process because you're not going to be able to meet again before That's that. Good time. point. Yep. Anna, did you want to add something? I mean, Is Anna, it, would that be helpful to you? I don't know that we need your official I, I mean, you asked a lot of really good questions that you probably want answers on from us first. And so um, there are so many other committees and town staff that we have to speak to. Um, I think you're you're fine. I can confirm this with Mandy tonight, but um, I think if you want to wait for us to get you answers on March 9th and then have a response from TAC at that point, that would be appropriate. Um, and just to confirm, you said the 9th, right? That that's yes. Well, the, right. So that was when Mandy was available because the other Thursday she is CRC. So. I know. I thought you had said the second, and I just wanted to make sure that it was the well. Next. Right. I had said the second, but she says she has CRC because she has yeah. CRC the same night that we have TAC. So we're yep. moving our TAC meeting for the to the ninth. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. But I, I agree with what Eve said. Of, of, at the ninth, once you have all our answers, a a process would be really really helpful to have some sort of formal response. Got uh, it. And it would be helpful to know then um, from TSO. I know we had included when I reached out to you and Mandy that I had asked, I had CC'd Anika Lopes as well, just as the TSO chair, just to get feedback from her about when when TSO would want tax feedback. I think given how many folks that you all are the first folks on that laundry list that we have met with. And so I think we're not totally sure when we're going to be done with that yet. So I'm not sure Anika has an answer for you at this point, but I will check back in with her. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So with regards to the um, bike and pedestrian networks map that we had marked up, I mean, it is coming up more and more, right? It's coming up as part of this discussion. It's been coming up at the planning board meetings. A couple of planning board members had reached out to me and said, what's the status of the bicycle and networks map? I know that um, in North Amherst, like Donuts reached out to about it. So if there's a way, I mean, Guilford, if you have suggestions about how to bring it to fruition and at least get those um, edits that we had made like into the GIS, that would be hugely helpful. And I know you're really busy. I know DPW is really busy, but. Well, lost my mouse. Um, it's just a matter of getting it into the schedule. It's just, there's a lot going on and it, it's just a lot going on. So it's just a matter of getting it into the schedule. Maybe we can get somebody this summer. Um, let's see how it goes. 
Yeah. It has been a few years now. It has. <laughs> but then we, we've been we've been talking about I've been talking about two things it's the whole time the TAC has been in existence. Mm-hmm. One, if, how does attack relate to everybody and how do they want things? And we just get stuff thrown at us and there's no rhyme reason or whatever how this works. And two is there needs to be more staff that can actually do things with the TAC to get things ready for people who have questions about stuff. And it's been ignored. It's been ignored the whole time. And yes, it's just frustrating. It's frustrating for me as much as it is for you. Yeah. Well, and we've talked about it in a previous meeting about the whole idea of becoming a commission, which I think could help. But the commission would need staffing. I mean, so that would be. Yes. And but it I, would at least give us something official, like that we're official. Yeah. And, and, and I think there's a staff. story in the paper today about someone going to cutting their budgets. Guilford, I mean, what's, I mean, the summer sounds really late, especially since, you know, this kind of policy is going forward right now. Um, you know, we've talked about uh, trying to get someone, you know, like a, I haven't do, done as a student GIS project. I know you haven't wanted to have a student come into your staff, but the data is all there. It doesn't sound like it's that technically difficult or if it would even take all that long for a, a skilled GIS person. What about just uh, offering it up as a um, a class project or a volunteer project. We have some internal issues with our GIS right now that I don't think the GIS coordinator would want. I don't know if he would want to allow other people in. We've been talking about it, and it's it's just it, um, there, there's just some issues, and we haven't worked through them yet. Until we work through them, we probably aren't going to get anywhere. I can't even get, I cannot get the 2022 or 2021 aerial photos on the GIS for the public to see. When you go on the public browser, you're looking from photos from 20, 2009. We just have some issues. So are you saying like you can't get the, like you wouldn't be able to get the data out to give to someone else to work on in a different system and then get back to you or something like that. I'm not, I'm not sure we have the ability to give it to somebody to do it and then get it back in and proof it to match back up the way it's kind of set up in our system. Um, Christine. Yeah. I mean, I just wonder it seems like we should be trying to get the town council what they need. So if we could even, is it possible to give them um, a, you know, crappy alternative, but, you know, like a, what the final map was with just the notes, can we write out the changes that we wanted to make to the final map? And so that, that um, you know, Anna and Mandy and whoever else would be at least getting the information, even if it doesn't all look perfect on the map. We can we can actually sit down and talk to them about what the changes were. Um, but one of the issues I think they're going to have is if you look at how they set up lighting zones, it's not based on um, it's not based on. Well, it's based totally on zoning, so it's um, I'm, I'm not really sure why and I know why they chose it, I guess. I'm not sure really sure that's the best route to use in a situation. Okay, like and this. you're saying in contrast to the map that the TAC made several years ago, which is based on based on desire lines and travel routes. Right. You can try, you can pass through several zoning distant districts. Well, so what I would want is for us to be able to just give to them what we obviously I wasn't there, but what this committee did several years ago. And if we can't give it to them in map form, um, I don't know, Eve, like would Amber be able to go back and get us all the meeting notes and we can get well, we we do have so. Uh, Chris, I have looked at, like, I know which meetings we talked about it at. I did look in the minutes, and but the minutes don't have the detail. Like, so we we probably yeah, need. Guilford had, had recorded right. those details. Or we also, like, go back to the recordings. Like, we have the meetings. We have to get back so. to the recordings, really. 
Okay, because you don't you don't have those notes, Guilford. Still, it sounds like or somewhere. <laughs> I do, but I keep I keep finding pieces of them all over my office. Oh, all right. Okay. Anyway, so um, yeah, I have the annotations on a PDF, but only for North Amherst. After that, right. it's just um Zoom meetings. Right. We'll, we'll we'll see what we can do on our end, but um yeah. I mean, it would be nice to have some Maybe, and then to share. Your, and then. So. I don't know if that type of feedback got back to them that we might want to be synergizing <laughs> the desire lines and the way people flow around, you know, in contrast to the zoning approach that they're taking. But, but I, th I think since that section of it is on hold for now, right, it's right, like right, part of the yeah. future discussion. So I guess I'd rather focus on the part that's there now and that it sounds like TSO and the counselors may still have like a number of questions about that part. And um, cause I have like major concerns about the basing it on zoning as well, including the fact that like a lot of low, like for example, you know, with um, that you can override some of the zoning, you know, when you build like low income housing and so on like that. So zoning alone is not reflecting like where people are walking the most in my opinion. So, but I guess we'll have to hold that for another time, so. And, and where people walk now is not necessarily where we want to be promoting you know, more walking in the future. Or more. I mean, and the good thing about our map is our map was really looking like village to village and, you know, origin to destination and like, what are the main corridors? Um, so I would hope that those could continue to be, have good lighting. So, all right, well, thank you. Yep, so, if you find any of your notes, could you Xerox them and give copies to Tracy? I can't. I have some of them. Okay, that that's helpful. I mean, I think uh, we're just gonna we're gonna work on recreating it. So, so I, en engineers are very close to being like doctors. You mean you you can't read it? Is that what you're you telling us? You, ha you have to really be them to understand their handwriting. If if but. we do, so are the all the Zoom meetings are because yes. because because there were you know what the way that we did the made the uh, those changes was we actually went segment by segment on a map that we zoomed in and so actually I mean we could easily recreate by going back to those meetings and recreating that on a you know now I can do all this very easily on my iPad and and write over those things I mean um that right. would be trivial if we have the recordings and it we was, have the we have the recordings it was just a few meetings right yeah and kim i went through it yeah. i think it's four or five meetings and i wrote yeah. down all the dates based on the minutes and the minutes don't include all those details of the discussion but they do note that like a discussion took place so we just need to go back to those and they are so, all, all available yeah, yeah so, it ends uh, up being a few nights of going through and just right. recreating and that is something we could certainly deliver Definitely. to um anna you know for for their use because I think it would be val it would be valuable for them and planning board and like yeah. other people who yeah. are asking yeah. us for that information so that's a good strategy so I'll go back in my notes and um, find what which meetings those were yeah. and maybe you and, and, and I maybe I mean and the links they're all on the town's YouTube page so we can work on that but um, yeah. okay okay I, right. I'd love to wrap this up does anybody yes. want to adjourn and Myra I'm sorry before we leave Myra you've been here the whole time do you have any comment question <laughs> I have not been here the whole time. Okay. I went, to, I went to what was supposed to be a ZBA meeting about, um, to which I was invited as an, a butter, but they didn't deal with that topic. Ah. Let us know that. So I came back and what I didn't hear was um, what questions you had for Anna about part one of their proposal. Right. So we only talked about part one, but. Um... Okay. I can talk to you. Okay, that sounds good. Thank yeah. We had a lot of questions, and Anna okay. graciously heard our questions. Part B is the part that I think is, in many ways, more important for pedestrians, cyclists, um, you know, drivers, because it's it's critical that people who are out in the dark can see where they're going. Um, yes, and where other people can see that where they're going. So. Um, Yes, we do, we do not disagree. Yeah, no, I know we don't. Um, okay, so <laughs> okay. Um, part one, right. I will talk to you about. Thanks. Sounds good, yeah. thank you. Uh, uh, motion eight. to um, adjourn. All right, second. Yes, okay, good night, everyone. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank night, you, Gilford. Everybody.
9th mm-hmm. at 5.30. Bye. Thank you, Anna. Bye-bye.